Okay, okay. okay. I, I basically tried to adhere to the, the, the CI, the corporate identity that uh, was set up last time, I think, during uh, the presentation of uh, Jürgen and his team. So um, you already said, so I would like to talk about interpretable PID parameter tuning for control applications and using uh, neural networks for this purpose. And um, okay, mm -hmm. I, this is a reporting about work that I did together with my former doctoral candidate or doctoral student, Johannes Günther, who is currently at, actually working in, uh, in Edmonton, working for Amy um, as a research scientist. And I think he even received a kind of an uh, adjunct professor position recently. So this was part of his, uh, his uh, work that led to his PhD and uh, we worked on this for a while together. So, so the main story starts that we, we look at various types of uh, very complex and highly nonlinear systems like space shuttle starts, we'll see if this is working, as well as uh, some uh, laser welding, laser material processing. And those are typically tasks that are fairly complicated and they also need a lot of control in order to work properly. So the, of course, if the control is failing in the uh, space shuttle, then the space shuttle would not probably start pro as we anticipate and hope for. And the same would also apply when we are building airplanes and cars, a lot of laser welding is employed, which is a highly complex process that needs control. So control, usually from a control engineering perspective, looks like as depicted in this picture, we have usually a plant or a factory or some system that needs to be controlled. And before this uh, plant, we have the so-called controller. And the controller is basically generating signals in order to push the plant in a direction that we want it to, to, to be. And so the plant is producing an output, a system output and the system output will be fed back to the input at the very input where it will be compared with the set point. And if the system, the plant is producing an output signal that is according to what we said and what the set point says, the error will be small. If the error becomes bigger because this plant is behaving in a different way, then this error signal will be fed into the controller and the controller will take action to bring this plant back on track. So that's the, maybe one of the most fundamental concepts in engineering at all, the feedback control loop. And uh, it's basically built into almost everything that we are dealing with on a technical level in daily life. And of course, how well this works and how, how well this, uh, the, the goals are accomplished is based uh, very much on the controller that has been, that's used for that purpose to control the plant. One of the most, ex well, most prevailing and most used structures, general structures for this controller is called a PID uh, controller. And the name comes because we are generating uh, an output signal, a control signal U, which is generated from the, starting from this error signal that we feed in by having a so-called proportional part. That is just a proportional reaction to the input signal on the output. Then we have one that is consisting of an integral part where this, uh, in, the error signal will be integrated. And there's also a portion that comes from differentiating the input signal E. And adding those things three together is generating the output signal U, which is now given as this KP, which is a parameter that, start, that controls the, the proportional part. Then K sub I is the uh, parameter that is controlling the integral part and the K sub D will be taking care of waiting in how much differential part will be coming a part of the output signal. So this PID controller, it's called PID because proportional, integral and differential. And it has three major uh, um, parameters. It's exactly those coefficients KP, K, KI and KD. So, and this is a, I would say, the majority of control systems uh, in the, around the world are using this type of a PID setup. So it's a tremendous success for control engineering over the years. 
but it's a, in that sense, static, static uh, controller. It's, it's only applicable for linearized or linear systems. If this, or, and if the system's behavior, if the plant's behavior is more or less stationary in time, so its properties will not completely change over time, so that the controller is matching the behavior of the plant. And if the plant is changing its behavior drastically, the controller may have a problem to follow. So this is maybe one of the, as I said, most prevailing um, control structures in, in technical fields. So why is this important for our discussion here in Abinet? So last time at our last event, we had a heard, uh, listened to a presentation given by Mr. Blankmüller and Sebastian Kolb and Jürgen Dahl. And it was about, uh, well, uh, power plants and how, how new ways of power plants could be uh, furbished for, uh, for our energy production. And there's among, among all those nice slides, there's one slide that is representing kind of the overall structure of processing modules in such a power plant. And there you can see that in this here, as the arrow points to it, there's a big PI bar of PID controllers. So that indicates that, of course, all those power plants are using PID controllers to control the dynamic behavior of such a power, power plant. And what I've learned over the years is that if once those PID controllers have been tuned and are designed in a way to fulfill their, their mission and to control the system properly, you better don't touch them. And if you are, if you are talking to a, a plant um, operator, you may not even have a look at the PID controllers because they are kind of sacred. You can't touch them. And that applies to many industrial settings where people are very nervous once you get close to the PID controllers and you want to fool around with them. So in an ideal world, we have, an, uh, let's say, a proce process control and there's a couple of challenges or things that we'd like to or we expect from such a controller architecture. There is no particular need for a priori knowledge, for prior knowledge, so the thing should be very generic. Uh, we also would hope that in such a situation that the system and the controller is consistently learning and adapting maybe to changing environments and changing behaviors. It should also learn and reject disturbances. So every once in a while there may be some hiccup in the, in the plant. Is the question is, is the controller capable of digesting hiccups and some disturbances in its processing? And of course, we would like to have this uh, controller to work without need of further human assistance. Uh, so that would be the requirement for an automatic controller. And as I said earlier before, PID controllers are ubiquitous in the industrial environment. And we also know that machine learning holds the promise to uh, give us more flexibility, more level, higher levels of automation if it comes to dealing with complex or maybe dynamical and even nonlinear systems. So the question is, can machine learning and tools for machine learning improve PID controllers along the lines of what is here, the challenges are. And that is what the study was about. Okay, so if you were falling asleep or if you can't really follow what I'm trying to explain, that we just recently published in December last year, a paper uh, together with Johannes Günther uh, and uh, exactly on the topic of my talk today. So what is the overall architecture and the proposal is we take our uh, architecture control where we have the PID controller and we have the plant and we extend this picture by adding this kind of a additional building block, which is a neural PID tuner. So that means this box contains a neural network and the neural network is taking in the system output V on the one side as well as the error signal coming in on the left side. So this will be the two input signals and those funky uh, uh, arrows, they indicate this, that those quantities may be vector valued. So they don't have to be uh, scalar values, they could be vector valued as well. So then we have these two input signals, we have a neural network and this neural network is supposed to be delivering three output signals, the KP, the KI, and the KD, those are the parameters of our PID controller. And then we can 
uh, push those values into the PID controller and let it operate and control the plant. So, so we have to, well, this is the overall architecture. So we hope that we will be able to control and to compute to determine the, the three parameters of the PID controller so that the PI3 controller gains some added benefits in terms of flexibility and um, maybe being able to just follow some changes in the environment. So what is the internal structure of this uh, neural network box? That's a so-called general dynamic neural network, not a very big one, but it's sufficient. We see here on the left side, the two input signals the V, the output of the system, as well as the error signal. And on the right hand side, we see the output signals, the parameters. So it's only a three layer network with one hidden layer. The specialty comes in that we also allow some of the feedbacks in, in this network. So we have some recurrency that some values from an internal, oops, sorry, uh, can be fed back to the in, input uh, nodes with a delay of one time instance. That's what the Z is standing for. It's a one time unit delay that we can introduce. So it is a network that allows even to have memory or can recall some stuff. And that is uh, important because we very often we are dealing with the time sequences with time series. And therefore we need some sort of memory to allow neural networks to have a memory. Okay, that means past inputs may have an input an influence on the outputs of the future or the current outputs. So this is a generic thing. So that one of the questions is how do you get to this particular structure? Well, as usually is done in all these neural networks, you just throw a lot of CPU cycles on the problem and try to figure out which of the, of the maybe uh, uh, typical candidates are the best for the job. So this is also the result of an extensive search through all sorts of different architectures for this network, including some that are only feed forward or uh, some that are uh, more general forms of recurrency and so on. So, and out of this uh, investigation of testing, I think about a hundred different structures, this was coming out as the most versatile and does the job and this it's not too complicated for computation purposes. So I think uh, we then um, also took this uh, new nine neuron uh, network, figured around a couple of uh, combinations uh, of the connections between the, the neurons and uh, worked uh, through a genetic algorithm for basically determining this type of final structure. So that's a different that talk on its own. Okay. Once we have a, um, a neural network and we want to train the neural network, then of course the, the people who know, are knowledgeable in neural networks to say, okay, back propagation is the tool of choice if we want to train uh, neural networks. In this situation here that we have, back propagation is not necessarily super uh, the best choice. And why? Well, if you are training a neural network, we have to have access to let's say the well, it's a supervised learning method methodology usually, and it means if you want to train for the correct values of KP, KI, and KD, we have to have the true values available. But since we don't have them, we can't really feed them, feed them in here. And of course, the system is input output system is given from the V star or this input all the way to the V on the end, and we do not have a full control over all the elements of this chain. So we may not be in a situation to uh, um, have the access to the error here in the middle. So we cannot use any, let's say, conventional backpropagation methodology for determining the values for the neural network. So the differentiation for creating this uh, backpropagation through the system is not possible. So we have to find other ways. So we use the uh, Gauss-Newton method for error minimization. So we basically optimize here those values in order to minimize this error. So the error that we are trying to control needs to be minimized. So that's what we're gonna do anyhow. That means by the operation of the PID controller, the plan should stay on track. And that feedback basically would mean that the error becomes minimum. So we can use that approach for setting up an algorithm that allows us to train 
the neural net parameters in a Gauss Newton step or Levenberg Marquardt or any type of optimization strategy that, that suits your purposes and what you like. So the, the good thing about this good Gauss Newton method is, is that we can uh, actually compute uh, the Jacobi matrix that is necessary for doing this optimization. We can approximately compute it numerically. So we don't have an analytic approach for this one, just numerical by observing a uh, temporal sequence uh, of error, of um, error signals. So we basically differentiate along the time axis and get a, a approximation uh, that is simple enough to compute for the Jacobi matrix. Okay, so what we are gonna do with this training or we have to feed the system with, uh, with signals in order to train. And we have, we've picked the number of, let's say, very typical uh, classical benchmark problems from control theory and from control engineering to test if this uh, PID controller with the net neural network is doing any good. So for that one is uh, one of the standard applications is the inverted pendulum on a card. So of course, you know the trick that you would like to keep the pendulum up uh, straight up and the only different the degree of freedom is that you can wiggle around with a little card at the bottom to, to balance the, the pole to stay upright. It's kind of a standard problem for rocket engineering. When you launch a rocket, you also want to make sure that the rocket goes up and you have a certain amount of control about the thrusts at the bottom to do a similar job. So that's a very standard problem. And the other one here, this is a chaotic problem on the right-hand side. So it's kind of a, a liquid that is flowing through this uh, circle here. The lower part will is heated. The upper part is, is uh, uh, a cooling of this one. And we would like to have a constant flow of liquid going through this, uh, this uh, thing. And it just by heating and by cooling, it generates all sorts of turbulences and trouble for the flow. And this needs to be uh, controlled as well. And here the feature is that this problem is, uh, leads to chaotic behavior at times. So it's a particularly nasty problem for control engineering tasks. So now we have, uh, we, we are using our little example. We train our model, uh, the network, uh, using uh, measurements and data that we generate from this model by exploiting the differential equations that describe the physical behavior of this setup. And then we uh, train by optimizing this, uh, set up this training for the neural network. And then we plug it in and let it run for a while. So that, that's what we kind of see, we can observe. And we have, uh, this is an example where we show you where we have a noise free situation. We have not added noise, but what we do add is at a time instant T equal to 10, here that spot here at 10, we basically give this pole at the top a, quite a hefty uh, push. So it's like a, well, try to get this uh, disturbance and see how the system is behaving. So we see here is kind of like X is like the behavior, the direction in which the car is, the car is moving. And we see different trajectories here. We see here, of course, the black line that goes through is like where it's supposed to be, the set point. And we see the gray dashed line is an LQ regulator, which is a kind of a state of the art control theory concept for solving this type of a control problem. Then we have here in gray is, is the, the standard PID controller. And in the black dashed one is our adaptive PID controller. We're using the neural network. So in the beginning, we see that the PID controller is doing a good job and all controllers are converging. And then we give the whole thing a kick. And then we see the regular PID controller and the standard controllers are just gone. They are gone and they can never come back. And this is the dashed line of our neural network operated PID controller. Of course, it also deviates and it just juggles, jiggles back and forth, but it basically brings the pole back into its nominal position. You can also see this here. This is kind of the angle of this pole, how it was kind of uh, uh, leaning over so it leans over, it basically is stable, 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 and then comes the disturbance. And that means here at time point T equal to 10, the controller, the regular controllers are gone. And we can see also how the pole is moving up and down using the co uh, control induced by the neural network. 
We can also, also look at the different things and we see here, this is the amplitude at the bottom here of our three PAD parameters, how they are evolving over time and adjusted by the neural network. And we can see, of course, at the time when the disturbance comes in, it, it just balances and adjusts to the situation. And then once the, the disturbance has been kind of control, under control, it goes back to a kind of a, a stationary behavior. That's quite nice. And the in, encouraging thing is that obviously all the other state-of-the-art controllers are not able to compensate this, this sort of disturbance. You see a similar effect when we're looking at the chaotic um, uh, system. Uh, we see also similar thing, and there we have also a, a change in behavior by heating up the heater by 100 watts if at time equal five. And then we also see that the systems are behaving in a very funky way. And we can also see our network controlled PID mechanism is the dashed black line here. And it seems to be coming back while the other controllers start oscillating and not really coming back anymore. So we can, we can see, okay, this seems to be interesting. And we see also here at the bottom, how the PID co coefficients are controlled and uh, adjusted by the neural network. So if you do a full extended uh, search and uh, investigation of all the um, of different uh, scenarios, we have here the inverted pendulum as a key benchmark. We also have this chaotic thermal convection loop I just mentioned. There's also other standard techniques or standard examples in control engineering, like a an linear time invariant system that has an input delay as well as a two tank system, which is maybe the most relevant actually for, for power plants, the two tank systems where the, the controller basically has to adjust the, white, the water problem, the height of the water in the two tanks. And we see there's a, an error measure uh, has been developed as uh, the root mean square of E of this error signal. The smaller the value is, the better it is. And then we have different nodes. This is kind of without any noise is the first column. The second column is we just add random noise to the measurement data and see how well the system can behave. Then we have again a noise free situation, but we kick the system, we give it a, a disturbance. And then we add noise and we give it a disturbance. And we can see different out in the top line is always the neural PID controller, which is in the bold phase numbers indicates this is the best one in its, in its performance in the root mean square error. And it's better in any case than the standard PID. And it's also better than a backstepping technique that's supposed to be the, the state of the art in this, or a, a candidate for state of the art in this context. Also for inverted pendulum, we see also that the, uh, uh, the neural PID is doing a better job. And well, the PID is also doing a good job as long as it's not disturbed too heavily. But if the disturbance comes in, you see this big deviation, then the PID is gone, is history, and uh, the neural PID is here. So, so we see a similar behavior, except here in the case with the LTI system, the delay, another uh, controller, the Smith predictor, is doing a better job, slightly better than the adaptive controller that I just introduced here. Okay, so control engineers are completely passionate and crazy about stability. Is the controller stable? And this is one of the things we always have discussions with when dealing with neural networks in control environments, that you have no guarantees if the controller is actually working um, stably. And stability means, is the system producing a bounded output as long as it will receive a bounded input? And for that purpose, we usually look at the transfer function from uh, for this closed loop system. And you see this is the H of S is the transfer function of the controller and the G of S is the transfer function of the system, the plant. And this will be the transfer function of the feedback loop system. And this system should behave in a stable form. And that means we basically say, okay, um, um, uh, can, we, can we give some guarantees and make some statements about the, the stability of this system? Stability means in the transfer function setting that all the poles and zeros are supposed to be in the left half complex plane, but I, I don't want to bore you with this one. 
I just let it run the system and we see like indicated here, we have the X, the output that we observe and we see the behavior and we have like indicated the over time, the parts where the system is not stable is like this gray shaded parts. And whenever it's white, then we can see that the poles and the behavior of the system is supposed to be stable. And we can see this is in our, um, um, I think it's the inverted pole. We can see that uh, uh, the transfer function converges to a stable part when, when the background is white. But you see here in between there is non-stable. This is the part when the title talks about transparency. We can I basically make an interpretation of our neural network in combination with the PID controller when it's not, it's not to be guaranteed stable. And here we have guarantees. We can also observe this in the, in the real part. We look at the, the real part of our uh, zeros and poles and there should all be negative for stability. And there we can see some of our coefficients here have a positive real part in this domain. That means here our system is not stable, but here we can see it's all stable. In those parts, they're all negative, even though it is just barely negative. So this is a major concern for control engineering to step on to look into using neural networks or any sort of modern machine intelligence for uh, control problems. So we have been testing, looking at the data, we can tell that the neural PID controller is clearly better than the standard PID controller in 15 out of 16 test cases that we checked out. The neural PID is also superior to, superior to model-based control, uh, also means for more sophisticated and other more standard, uh, let's say state-of-the-art technologies in most cases, in seven out of eight or in 13 out of 16 cases, the neural PID controller has superior behavior. And the stability analysis that we can run by looking at the poles of the, the, the PID controller allows us to check for, for, for stability and make it interpretable. Um, well, optimality for the network structure is something, of course, uh, the control engineers are always keen to have some formal proofs of optimality that we cannot deliver yet. And we have no formal proof yet of convergence yet. However, all the experiments that we have been running through until now show clearly that this uh, setup is, is, is producing convergent solutions and they seem to be behave quite nicely. But of course, having a lot of good examples is not a proof and the control is living on rigorous, on rigorous proofs. And that's uh, something we still have to work on a little bit. So conclusions, can machine learning improve controllers, PID controllers? Yes, it can. We can show that stability and convergence, learning without prior knowledge is possible, no expensive hard or software required. So we don't have to come up with fancy schmancy stuff. It's relatively simple. The stability analysis is also uh, allowed because we have explainable neural network steps. And then most importantly, this type of intelligence can be integrated in any, let's say, plant situation within the existing infrastructure. So we don't have to rip out the PID controllers we can just add on to the existing infrastructure and that makes acceptance of such a technology quite uh, well easy. And uh, a little bit picking up on the topic of last presentation that Jürgen and his team gave, they were talking about something and I would like to, I, it was triggering in me, inside of me, the notion to uh, Daft Punk, they, who had lost their stability and gave up. But the song that is relevant is harder, better, faster, stronger. And I think that's a quite a good motto for uh, the PID controllers with the neural network extension. What's coming up next? So here we have a little video and I show you a little uh, quadrocopter flying. I hope this works. Can you see flying? The flying quadrocopter? Yes, yes we can. Okay, good. I'm not sure this goes through, okay. This is a quadrocopter that's flying in our laboratory. It's controlled with a PID controller. And uh, now, of course, one of the things is that we, the, the, the proponents of the recurrent neural or neural networks would say, well, get, away, get rid of this PID controller. We can do it with neural nets. We have trained the neural networks in simulation and plugged in the trained models in this one. Oops, that was the wrong one. And I show you the performance of a hovering quad, uh, quadrocopter 
that is controlled with a neural network without PID controllers. That's pretty disappointing so far. So that means so far we would still stick on uh, using PID controllers and neural networks to control the PID co coefficients and working on trained neural networks directly for controlling uh, the drones may be something we still have to think a little bit about. Stability is not great as you can see. Okay, that's basically the end of my talk and uh, thank you for all your attention. And if you have any further desire for discussion, I will be ready and hope, happy to, to comply. Thank you so much.